APGO Educational Topic Number 45, Normal and Abnormal Uterine Bleeding. Abnormal uterine bleeding is menstrual flow outside of normal regularity, frequency, volume, or duration. In the United States, more than 10 million women suffer from abnormal uterine bleeding. This common medical problem can adversely affect a woman's daily activities and responsibilities with significant social, medical, sexual, and emotional impacts. Although abnormal uterine bleeding can affect adolescents and women of reproductive age, the majority of cases occur in the 5 to 10 years prior to menopause. Abnormal uterine bleeding accounts for more than 70% of all gynecological consults for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. Meet Dr. Palm Cohen, obstetrician gynecologist extraordinaire. In this video, we will discuss normal menses and how Dr. Palm Cohen can help women with abnormal uterine bleeding. The objectives of this video are to define the normal menstrual cycle and describe its endocrinology and physiology, define abnormal uterine bleeding or AUB, define the pathophysiology and possible etiologies of AUB, define the steps in the evaluation and management for AUB, and finally summarize the medical and surgical options for AUB. Let's talk about the normal menstrual cycle. It is predictable and precisely regulated. The cycle lasts 21 to 35 days, and remember this is the time between the first day of one menses to the first day of the next menses. The duration of menstrual flow is 4 to 6 days with a loss of approximately 30 cc's of menstrual blood. Let's discuss the mechanics of how this cycle works so predictably. Here is a timeline starting with day 1 of menses, and here is day 28. We'll look at gonadotropin and hormone levels in relationship to ovarian and endometrial changes. Let's look at the ovary first. A primary follicle develops during the follicular phase and becomes the dominant follicle. We will label that follicle D. This follicle secretes increasingly large amounts of estradiol, and you can see the estradiol levels rising here. During the follicular phase, LH levels increase and there is a surge on day 11 to 13 of the cycle. This LH surge triggers ovulation. So here you'll see the dominant follicle now becoming the corpus luteum after ovulation. This corpus luteum produces large amounts of progesterone and thus progesterone levels rise rapidly after ovulation. The progesterone has a negative feedback on the pituitary gland. The corpus luteum also produces some estrogen. The uterine lining is stimulated by the rising levels of progesterone to get ready for implantation and progesterone stimulates the endometrial lining to become secretory endometrium. The endometrial glands become tortuous and contain secretory material. At the end of the luteal phase, serum concentrations of estradiol, progesterone, and LH reach their lowest levels. In response to these low levels, FSH begins to rise in the late luteal phase before the onset of menstruation to recruit the next cohort of follicles. If conception does not occur, the corpus luteum envelopes, progesterone and estrogen production declines, and menstruation occurs in response to low estrogen and progesterone level. During menstruation, the entire endometrium is expelled and only the basal layer remains. During the follicular phase, the rise in estrogen levels stimulate endometrial cell growth. The endometrial stroma thickens and the endometrial glands become elongated to form proliferative endometrium. Wow, that was a lot of hardcore basic endocrinology. Let's move back to the world of clinical diagnosis. Historically, there have been many terms used to describe AUB, such as metraraja or menometraraja. However, the acronym Palm Colon has been introduced to describe AUB that replaces these historical terms. Here is a clever cartoon illustration created by Dr. Asha Youssef that helps explain the Palm Cohen acronym. Here is our patient, and she has a uterus and an endometrial cavity. The P of Palm Cohen stands for polyps, so the P's are in the endometrial cavity. The A stands for adenomyosis, and you can see that she has a globular and enlarged uterus characteristic for adenomyosis. The L stands for leiomyoma, so I'm going to draw multiple leiomyomas in her uterus. The M stands for malignancy, and here we can see mean malignant masses. The C stands for coagulopathy, and here you see a C-shaped liver. The liver is making markedly decreased coagulation factors. The O stands for ovarian dysfunction. So here is a sad looking ovary, and it's a sick ovary too. The E stands for endometrial process. Most of these processes are affected by estrogen. The I stands for iatrogenic. So here is an injection of heparin. The N stands for not yet classified. 
the usual causes of AUB vary over a woman's lifetime. For adolescent women, the most common cause will be ovulatory dysfunction. This is specifically from anovulatory bleeding from immaturity of the HPO axis. Regular periods are usually established within two to three years of menarche. If an adolescent woman presents with heavy periods, it's also important to remember coagulation disorders such as von Willebrand's disease. For women of reproductive age, ovulatory dysfunction is still a common cause of AUB. And the most common cause of ovulatory dysfunction will be polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS. PCOS affects 6% of all women of reproductive age. Pregnancy and related complications are a common cause of AUB, so don't forget to check a pregnancy test. Sexually transmitted diseases such as gonorrhea and chlamydia can also cause abnormal uterine bleeding. Perimenopausal women have increased incidence of anatomic sources such as polyps, adenomyosis, leiomyomas, or malignancy. Anovulatory dysfunction is also a common cause of AUB in perimenopausal women, secondary to declining ovarian function. Let's move on to the evaluation of AUB. How do we go about figuring out what is the potential cause for a patient's AUB? We need to start with a good history. Find out how heavy her periods are and importantly the pattern of bleeding. The following scenes will illustrate Dr. Palm Cohen in action. Dr. Palm Cohen, my periods are not predictable nor regular. This may be ovulatory dysfunction. This ovulatory dysfunction could be secondary to PCOS or perimenopausal anovulation. Dr. Poncone, I am bleeding in between my periods. This sounds like an anatomic source. The anatomic source could be a submucosal fibroid or a uterine polyp. Dr. Poncone, I have always had very heavy periods. I wonder if you have a coagulopathy. The most common inherited coagulopathy would be von Willebrand's disease. Don't forget to also ask about medical or herbal remedies that she may be taking. Let's move on to the physical exam. Look for signs of excessive weight gain, signs of PCOS such as hirsutism and acne. Think about signs of thyroid disease and signs of insulin resistance. Physical exam findings suggestive of a bleeding disorder would include petechiae, ecchymoses, skin pallor, or swollen joints. Pelvic examination, including bimanual examination, should of course be performed to assess the size and contour of the uterus. When deciding upon diagnostic testing, remember again that we are trying to determine the source of the AUB. There should be a low index of suspicion to perform an endometrial biopsy to rule out endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancer for women over 40 or who have risk factors such as obesity or diabetes. Laboratory evaluation should include a complete blood cell count to look for anemia and a TSH to rule out thyroid disease. It's worth repeating here, don't forget to evaluate for pregnancy in any reproductive aged woman. A pelvic ultrasound is usually the best radiologic study for evaluation of the gynecologic organs. Treatment will of course depend on the etiology for her AUB. If anovulatory bleeding is the source of her AUB, then medical therapy with oral contraception or cyclic progesterone can be used. A levonorgestrel IUD is also an excellent treatment option for these women. An endometrial ablation is also an option, however endometrial hyperplasia has to be ruled out first with an endometrial biopsy. If the source of the bleeding is an anatomic one, such as an endometrial polyp or submucosal fibroid, then she may need surgical management. Hysterectomy is an option when conservative medical and surgical options have been discussed and tried. This concludes the APCO educational video on normal and abnormal uterine bleeding. We have covered quite a bit with the normal menstrual cycle, abnormal uterine bleeding, and the initial evaluation and management steps for AUB. Mm -hmm.